Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 984. So today we're gonna finally fix the uh, TNT card. It's technically already fixed. I did find a problem with it that made it not work for Axel and uh, why it's also not working for me in some motherboards. In my YouTube video where I uh, added some uh, new caps to the front here and uh, added all the missing components at the back. I used this motherboard here which you would recognize if you saw that video, probably. So this is uh, should be an MSI board, MS6309. So it's a Socket 370 board with Universal AGP, which is convenient, testing graphics card. So this works just fine, and that's the odd thing, because I have other motherboards, obviously. So I have this iWill motherboard. It has the same VIA chipset as the other motherboard, but if I put this card in here and uh, try to post it, it just won't work. It actually gives VJ beeps. So this is like the board it likes the least for some reason. I had the idea of obviously reballing the ship because I figured it was a crack on one ball there, but that's probably not the thing. It just looks like it. That ball looks different to all the other ones, uh, but it seems to not matter. Before I do something like that, I obviously want to verify the bias I figured, but the reason I didn't look into the bias originally is it works on this motherboard, but no other motherboard, which to me seems to indicate a hardware problem. But uh, anyways, I... Uh, Loaded up NV Flash. You can use that to flash and read biases from your graphics card. So I dumped this BIOS, went in on Vogons and downloaded the identical BIOS to this one. And then I ran the diff command in Linux and it would say there is a difference. Um, then figured, yeah, I'm probably with corruption then. But why is this working on this motherboard and not the other ones? So I took another program called VB Indiff. And that's pretty good for binary files because the ordinary diff doesn't really tell you anything other than the fact that it differs. So VB in uh, diff will show you the files side by side in binary format in hex, I think, uh, for a call. And it will show you di the difference of one by one if you press enter. So very easy to step through. And it was only one step. So it's just one, one bit had flipped. And th that was the year, the year the, the copyright of the bias is uh, printed twice in the ROM and on my card in one place it had 99 for the year and another place it has 98 so that's in the, at the end that would be a single bit flip now this could be a typo because this is beginning on the file and it's kind of odd that this is, is the date because that in itself wouldn't make the BIOS not technically work. But what occurred to me is that I have modded a BIOS once before for an SD card not that long ago, quite recently. Uh, Followed some instructions on Vogons and I actually wrote a more thorough guide on, in that uh, thread how to do it. So basically on my S3 card, if you make a change anywhere in the BIOS, there's also a place in the BIOS where you have to make a small update. You can call it the checksum area. So on the S3 card, uh, I want to change the clocks because I want a new, newer BIOS that had a bug fix, but the clocks were way lower than my card was actually made for. So that was kind of annoying. So I changed the clocks, and then you have to basically, in the S3, generate a new checksum, essentially. And that's also based on the fact that, that you save the information of the checksum in the BIOS file, so it's kind of like inception. So we can imagine the BIOS file, you make a checksum of almost the whole file and then what you get there, you, com you compute a checksum from that through some means and then you update the very last, I think it's one byte or something. So what occurred to me is that if there's only one bit that has changed between my BIOS here and the ones that I can find on the internet for the same version, 1.10, for this card, exactly the same. Well, you can't just have one bit flip because if you flip one bit, well, you, then you haven't flipped a bit, at least one bit for the checksum. So you need to, if you make a change somewhere, you also need to update the checksum because the whole point is that the checksum should always change if you just make make a single bit flip somewhere, even intentionally. So like I did with S3, changing the clocks to what my original device had. So I figured out that this byte must be corrupted. So I just took the new one and now this will post in uh, not only just this motherboard, as it did before, but the, it actually when it posts in this motherboard now, it doesn't show the like velocity 4400 string and stuff like that. And it also, Windows were instantly like, this is a new graphics card. So it actually made a difference on here in terms of how the computer sees the card. So I took this motherboard where I knew it would just VJ beep. 
obviously install it, put it in, and then hit the power. It would instantly post no problems. And Windows would uh, find it and install the drivers because the drivers were on the Compa Flash card I had. And it would work just fine. Because of a bit had been flipped either in by a developer, I don't know. It seems odd to me that the bit flip is on the date. Because it's very early in the file. So could that have been like someone made, made a 1.10 BIOS and made a typo, realized the mistake, and then updated it without updating the version, and then some of these cards got out there. I don't know, because they clearly work in some other word. Or is this just uh, random, that like just that particular bit in the beginning flipped on the date? I don't know. And did it flip when the card was on being used, or did it flip when it was being stored? I don't know. Now the checksum matches what the contents of the ROM, so to speak. So this card is actually working now. So I used NV4 flash that came basically came with these biases to flash the bias back again. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty quick procedure. The screen flickers right through a couple of times, so you really don't see much, and then it's done. So this card is technically working now. So what I want to do now is actually finish it up, put a fan on it, put some extra caps on it. So let's get into actually finishing up this card and make it what I want it to be. And then uh, I'm gonna obviously test it properly again. And uh, we're gonna put it in the system it's supposed to be in. I think we start by adding a fan connector. So I actually found this comp site to some uh, arbitrary connector here. And I actually found a card that was broken that had uh, pro the proper connector. So we're gonna solder this to here. Now we're just going to cut the, uh, cut the wire and use that for the fan cable. Let's install this uh, fan header here. Next up I bought uh, 10 of these uh, polymer caps, something that would fit here. So these are 390 microfarads, 6.3 volts. So this whole card is 3.3 volts when it comes to memory and GPU. So it takes uh, basically 3.3 volts from the PSU. So the quality of the PSU and also the filtering and quality on motherboards PCB do affect how well, for example, the memory clocks. I tested that on uh, motherboards with the Matrox G400 and uh, yeah, a couple of megahertz difference from board to board and power supply to power supply. So these empty slots here, I think are used with a voltage regulator here. There is five volts coming in there. So you probably can use some other voltage than 3.3 if we need to, so we can reconfigure this PCB. Right now it seems to be configured with some zero ohm resistors I suspect on the back to feed 3.3 directly to the GPU. But I also looked at other TMT cards and some actually have a cap installed here, even if they obviously don't have the regulator. And there's no reason we can't use them because I checked this is 2.3 volt on both these locations. So putting some caps there is really not an issue. The advantage I would say is you get some bulk capacity if your motherboard doesn't have much of that or your power supply is kind of crap. It would be nice to have some extra filtering straight on the graphics card. And uh, since we have no regulators, like what the regulators to care too much about, uh, we can uh, go polymer I figured because the, there's no re risk for oscillations that you can get apparently. If you if you go too low ESR on some old uh, regulators you can get issues. But there's none on this board so it's not an issue. So I found some cheap on sale polymers, so about 10 of those for like $3 or something like that. They can serve as both bulk storage because of being rated at 390 microfarads, these small ones are on here at 10. But since they have very low ESR also, they could filter out some extra ripple. So the whole idea is basically to get cleaner power to your card, essentially. Not needed, but why not? So my plan is just to clean up this pad from old solder, probably nothing wrong with it, but it's, uh, yeah. I usually want to retain them, plus I only want one of the pads, so I have 10 on them right now. And uh, the reason I'm using the plate for this is just uh, to allow the solder to easy, more easily flow under the SMD polymer here.
So I'm just gonna tack it on one side there for now. Here we have the card with the new polymer caps on here for some extra bulk filtering and uh, ripple suppression. So this 5 volt fan here needs a cable harness from this one. Ground was to the far right. Let's uh, adapt this fan to fit the card. So I'm gonna remove the old wires or the new old wires. And use these old new wires instead. It's pretty common with 5 volts only available on uh, old graphics card. Like you can probably pick up 12 volt close to the AGP connector, but if there is a, a place for a fan header and it happens to be 5 volt, I'll buy a 5 volt fan. I don't like cables hanging off my cards if I can avoid it. It's not like it's only cosmetic, but yeah. And it's something less to deal with when you're swapping cards around. So we really don't need a long one because as you saw there's a really short distance to the connector. So I tend to make them a little bit long and then I just cut off what I don't want for a solder in place. That way we end up with much nicer uh, Leads. And because this is a modern new fan, there's gonna be lead free solder here. I don't like that. Pick this tip because it's kind of easy to get into places, but it is horrible for any kind of soldering. So that is the fan, ready to go on a graphics card. Time for a fan. So it should fit pretty well. But we need to screw it in place. So I looked in my stash and find some uh, screws that should fit stainless ones. So we have a completed card as I intended it, fan for cooling, so no more TNT that would burn up, they're known to be a bit hot, but it should be fine. 
som polymer caps och som uh, bulk capacity och som uh, lower ESR för ripple filtering. Så so, yeah, I think this is gonna work out really really nice. So let's test this thing out and testing a motherboard that didn't work in before. Everything is hooked up for testing here. So this is my normal uh, socket T the lab board. It has an ASA slot here. This one do not. This board would not work with this card before. So we're gonna power it up here. It's a, bit, a little bit loud at fair, but it's fine. Got signal. So it's posting on a board it did not post before I flashed reflashed the BIOS. Why it works on this board, uh, the other one, I don't know. Because the other one seems to, to check uh, the BIOS if it's sane or not, and this one seems to just ignore that. So that's a bit odd, but I don't actually know how the whole uh, uh, check something works when it comes to verifying it, like if it's complete up to the motherboard or not, and if it should adhere to that or not. But BIOSes do tend to have a checksum that needs to be computed and um, you know, integrated into the BIOS, so to speak. Which uh, now with the bits uh, not flipped on the date uh, there, the checksum should add up and the card posts. We're going to swap out the bench in my Pensum 2 machine. So this video is just as much as a, a part 5 of the Pensum 2 build and this is a second part of the TNT, T, TNT car fix video. So there's really nothing wrong with the bench here, but uh, they're quite similar. Uh, as long as we can run glide on the bench here, it's pretty much as fast. The problem is the TNT is Faster, at least on paper, similar clocks, but it has two TMUs and also support 32 bit color. But you lose glide in return, so there is that. It's definitely faster than Quake 2, that's for sure. Similar in Quake 3. In 3D Mark 2000, this thing just crushes the bench. I think the best I got out of the bench was 1255, and the best I got out of this. Uh, after the, those two caps was, was added, I managed to get uh, 2504, I think, or something like that. Uh, by getting through with the 125 on the memory, it's really hard to do before. Now I can do it twice over. Though it really didn't reflect much of an improvement in Quake 2, which is a good stability test. But anyways, I got the record after putting those caps on. Personal best on this card. There it is, installed. So, power is connected here. And I check my monitor. So if I hit this button, it should work. And I left the, the case off, so to speak, out the shell. Because uh, the law of computing is you don't put it on until you have a fully working post and boot. Yeah, I want this to post. Looking for a blue light here. A beep, a blue light. Yes. So the TNT is working. So... I'm gonna actually reinstall this machine now because I got the installer on D cola and all the games on E cola. That's intentionally so I can do a quick quick format and reinstall. And the reason why is so I can get a completely clean environment with the proper drivers that I'm gonna put in here now. Pull them down over FTP. A little bit if I image with no drivers. And after that I can benchmark with this card because I do have some scores from my last part from the from the Pension 2 build, part 4. And if you're hearing weird noises, that's because it's snowing outside and they're plowing the roads, so it's like 4 inches or something. It's not a lot, but uh, relatively speaking, enough for cars to not like it. All intents and purposes, the TNT is working. Reinstall and then we're gonna do some benchmarking. We're in Windows and everything is reinstalled. So the, we should have the TNT here somewhere. For some reason everything turned into Swedish for my drivers for some reason, but that's NVIDIA, I always, have always done that. Figured these were English only because it hasn't happened with the same version before, but for some reason NVIDIA decided Swedish. We've got the adapter here, NVIDIA Riva TNT. I figured we run some uh, benchmarks and compare to the bench result I got in my Pension 2 video series here. The games are exactly the same, except I swap from Glide over to OpenGL. And uh, since we're supporting multi-texturing now, that can be used with TNT. We 
we got the 94.8 FPS and with the bench we got 72.4 so that's like a pretty big improvement So yeah, Quake 2 runs really well on the Call of TNT. Next would be Quake 3 here to compare that. So we got 125.5 and the bench had 135. So almost a 10 FPS drop. The gains we got in Quake 2 is a trade off that is worth it. I did benchmark some Unreal Tournament, so we're gonna start it up here. So I have a custom made benchmark. Now Direct3D refuses to turn off VSync and I can force it up in the drivers, but that causes a lot of flickering and weird stuff. So that's not really an option. So you're stuck with OpenGL. And OpenGL by default doesn't support multi texturing, it seems. Only Direct3D. So, Direct3D seems faster, but you're running into the wall of your, your refresh rate on your monitor. It's kind of bad for benchmarking. So we're running a benchmark here and it takes quite a long time. I'm not gonna run it because I actually modified the Unreal Tournament so run a little bit faster with the TNT. So with the bench I got uh, 53 FPS. I got a crappy mobile phone picture there but that's the bench running pretty much max it out. A little bit faster than that even. And then uh, I ran the TNT with the same settings but with uh, OpenGL instead of uh, Glide that I ran on the bench because the TNT can obviously not run uh, the glide API and uh, the TNT scored uh, 43.3 FPS so pretty much 10 FPS lower than the Banshee so it's uh, it's quite significant uh, difference in uh, smoothness when you play now it's I don't think it's that the Banshee is faster what actually is going on here is that Unreal Tournament is a real CPU pick so it wants, all this, it wants a lot of CPU horsepower it's not very dependent on the GPU actually so the fact that glide is less CPU heavy saves CPU cycles for, for the game to do other stuff so I think that's why the Banshee is faster which obviously means that a Banshee or a Fiatus card is usually a better pick if, you, if your CPU is weak now I did also run something called the uh, UTGL R34 34 is just the version 3.4 but that one works on Windows 98 if you go into preference menu, uh, tools, system console, preferences. So you go in here and change a few things. I don't remember exactly, but I had to turn on, off, I think, SSC. So here's OpenGL. If you had a vanilla OpenGL driver, you would only have a few entries here. You would definitely not have like multi texturing. Uh, but you also got like SCC and stuff like that. I turned that off and some other things because otherwise I got like one frame per second. But once I had that uh, OpenGL renderer, the more modern one, I'm getting about 50 and a half frames per second. So a little bit slow still than the Banshee, but uh, very close. So we can make up for that difference. So overall, I think the TNT, at least on paper, is the stronger card with extra TMU. They clock quite equally. Uh, the Banshee, obviously, with this glide support, you can run glide games, and that is also less CPU heavy, which means that sometimes when you see CPU bound, the, the Banshee will perform better. So they trade those pretty well, I think. And we can uh, run my benchmark into the two bits colors as it was intended to be run. 
It's gonna be a little bit slow, but uh, this will be fun. And uh, downsize it to 512 by something. 84. See how it runs now. And this, that's just a bug in the blue stuff there. I have fixed it, but uh, not in this version. So I'm getting good frame rate now. Actually, a very good frame rate. But here is where it usually drops. I wonder if I go up a notch. Yeah. And if you go full screen, it's gonna kill it. But it looks cool anyway. That's the downside with the 2 bit color. The performance goes bye bye with the older graphics cards. But still. So yeah, I think that is pretty much it for uh, upgrading this computer. So we're at the end of this video and the uh, TNT card is fixed. Uh, and the Pension 2 machine has the TNT card it originally had, not the same one obviously, but one like it. And uh, I did actually benchmark the TNT card uh, a few times in uh, 3 Mark 2000 on a Pension 3 700 at 933. And I managed to get 2,502 points. Uh, I did simulate the Pension 3 466 on that board with 66 bus and uh, SSC turned off in Trademark 2000 and I got like 2,100 some points. So I estimated I should hit something like that on this one. But uh, I ended up at 1,620. So I think there's actually more performance to be had out of, out of the TNT even with this Pension 2 400 at 450 MHz. Despite 3D Mark uh, scoring a lot less than I expected, it was still about 400 points over the Banshee, which did about 12.55. So the TNT is clearly faster in 3D Mark 2000, and it's also faster in Quake 2 by a pretty good margin. In Quake 3, we lost a few frames, about 10. So the Banshee was overall better there. In Unreal Tournament, the Banshee is also slightly faster, especially if you run the vanilla renderer. Which was probably due to Unreal Tournament being so CPU heavy and the Glide API requiring less CPU power. But uh, with an updated uh, OpenGL renderer, I could, could take back most of that. Uh, also getting multi-texturing support. So yeah, the training blows quite nicely. But uh, I'm thinking I'm gonna stick with the TNT here because uh, I got 32 bit color support, which works with my demos I'm working on. I think that's it for this video, but uh, before I say goodbye, Axel sent in another TNT. So this one lacks four memory chips, so this is a 64-bit version. Uh, I think he said it was untested, but yeah. So it has 8 megabytes of VRAM, so my plan is to try to upgrade this and see if we can do that. I don't know if it will work or not, but that's the interesting part I guess. So yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public lands when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.